We will continue our conversation on the topic of ecosystems and will now put our focus on Europe. In a time in which our continent is being rattled by various political and economic turbulences, the challenge ahead and above all, finding answers to how we can establish Europe's position on the digital landscape will have a great impact on this continent for generations to come. Yeah, and we were very happy that we have a diverse group of experts here uh, on the panel who bring their very own perspective on the topic to the table. So please welcome the CEO of Raiffeisen Bank International, Mr. Johann Strobel. <laughs> the, the head of Central and Eastern Europe at Amazon Web Services, Mr. Jim Fanning. The Ambassador of the United States of America to Austria, Ambassador Trevor Trainer. The CEO of T-Mobile Austria, Mr. Andreas Bierwirt. And our insightful moderator for this exciting discussion, the Director of the CUNY Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism, Mr. Jeff Chavis. Welcome. Good morning. Um, we come in interesting times, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here as one of the uh, few Americans in an international audience. That's what I love about Darwin's circle, is it brings together uh, not just Austria, but, but all around the world. Um, our task is to talk about opportunity and to try to explore what that opportunity is and, and see where we can go in Europe particularly. Uh, so I'd like to start, uh, I think we just heard about Tencent, and, and I know that we in America are, remain in awe of what WeChat can do and have no sense of it, and it's a mystery to us. Um, and we have a little fear, too, that you've discovered a world uh, that uh, we don't understand yet. Uh, but I'd like to ask first, as you're the main representative of the company here in Europe, where do you see the opportunities here in Europe for Tencent? Thank you for the question. Uh, we aim to be a digital assistant, and we recognize ourselves as a technology and culture company. So normally, when we are looking for opportunities in Europe, we look at companies or startups combining these two elements. I can perhaps illustrate this with a few examples. For example, from a technology perspective, we are looking around the world, um, partnerships with leading universities in deep tech areas such as quantum computing, artificial intelligence, natural language processing um, in leading universities here in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the UK, as well as in California and Boston. And um, we also have a second example, perhaps is in AI health area. We have several notable collaborations with AI plus medicine startups. For example, there is a company called Babylon, and it's, um, um, it's a mobile health startup. And now they have developed really quickly. So we are bringing their triage service and integrate it on WeChat, so people don't need to book a, a time-consuming com appointment with the doctors, but they can um, do everything on WeChat. And we have also established collaborations with Nature Publishing Group and set up Young Scientists Award and encourage scientists, no matter which leading technology area field they are in, uh, but we would help with the ecosystem. And from a cultural perspective, I don't know if anyone here watches Blue Planet 2, of, um, that's from the BBC. It's actually co-produced by the BBC and the Tencent. We have 220 million viewers across the globe, so it's a record on its own. And on the game side, we are looking to bring or bring games, our games to Europe, and as well as bring publish 
very successful games to, on our platform and also looking at IP collaborations. Everyone, I think, around the world is waiting for another big shoe to drop, which would be WeChat leaving China and coming into other markets. Are there any plans? I think there are already lots of people in Europe actually are already using it as well as the States. I think it's an organic process. Jim, uh, we'll start with the, with the outsiders here. So as, <laughs> as a representative of an American company, uh, what, AWS is a presence here, Amazon is a presence itself in five countries in Europe. Uh, what are the other European opportunities that Amazon is pursuing here? Sure. Well, if, if you look at Amazon Web Services, which, uh, which is the business unit that I represent, we're, we're looking to really help all countries within Europe and all companies within Europe uh, digitally transform and innovate. I mean, that's fundamentally what am the principle of Amazon Web Services is built upon, is helping companies innovate, unleash the legacy, right, and, and really for the largest companies to work at startup speed and find new opportunities, new, new business ventures uh, within their own companies. Any specific uh, investments or, or that, that have been made so far? Sure, yeah. If you look at uh, some of the investments that we've made across Europe, uh, we have development centers today <clears throat> in Poland uh, as well as in, in Bucharest. Um, so we're, we're tapping into the, the tech talent uh, that exists throughout Europe. And then we're also, through Amazon Web Services, helping companies understand how they can leverage that, that new cloud technology for their businesses. Ambassador, um, I'm sure the, the, the Viennese here know this, but I, but I learned only recently that your grandfather was ambassador here, so you got to play in the, in the uh, residence right. uh, back in the day. So you've seen a long-term presence. And you're, you're an American entrepreneur. Uh, what do you see as the opportunities, uh, especially for American companies and investors in Europe? Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. This is the coolest building, but I'm so upset the elevator isn't working. It's like the <laughs> single coolest thing in all of Vienna. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've, I've been coming to Austria ever since I was a boy. And I think the thing that's interesting to me, you know, I've founded or co-founded five companies. And so um, I am by job an ambassador, but I really am a tech entrepreneur at heart. And um, the people who I meet here, the tech entrepreneurs are incredible. They are just like the tech entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Same, you know, intelligence, energy, ideas. Um, and I try to work with them and help them. The only thing is the ecosystem here is not the equal of, of Silicon Valley. It just isn't. And it's not because people don't want it to be. Uh, I talk with government ministers, and they are trying to make it more um, e friendly for entrepreneurs. But there are just significant hurdles here that we don't have in the States. You know, how to get money, how to, how to even incorporate uh, the bankruptcy laws, things like that. So... Um, uh, but as far as raw material, I think that more U.S. investors should be looking at startups and entrepreneurs here. And I think the local entrepreneurs, um, as uh, Marcus and others have mentioned, should think globally sooner, you know, because they need scale that they can't get just in Austria. Yeah, I was with uh, some entrepreneurs last week from the Bayern Media Lab. Uh, who came through New York, three really wonderful companies. I was very impressed. And it was an interesting cultural moment because as the, uh, as the, as the, the American, I was saying, oh, the world can be yours, expand. As the Germans, they were thinking more like Mittelstand, <laughs> right? Which is probably wise because they're focusing on, their, on what they do best in their opportunity, uh, but uh, they don't have the ambition of scale, I think, that may be possible. These are companies that I really think could be huge. Johan, you're in the financial world here in Europe. How do you see this, this view of Europe investing in itself? You know, I, I'm happy and I want to thank you to be invited here. I mean, representing the, the incumbent industry, if I may say so, um, this is a great opportunity to support, uh, to support our transformation because, you, you know, the, the traditional banking industry is stuck in the traditional role, which is being uh, transformation, being responsible for capital allocation in the very traditional way. So we 
we tend to miss, and especially because of the financial crisis, we were focused on many other things. And I think we missed quite a lot of these developments, what we're talking here. So it's a big chance to, to close that gap and to get more involved. Um, and, and in terms of, of structure financing these developments, again, I, I agree, we, we miss one important part. Banks are regulated in a very narrow way and it's hardly possible to, to finance any startup. You have so many regulations, you need cash flows, you need assets, whatever. So typically what uh, startups not have and probably for a long period of time if ever don't need. So it's difficult for banks. The way we do it is we start in a in a small way, in small steps, so we, we established our own accelerator program, so we cooperate with fintechs, and that's the way, so we try. Financing currently is difficult, there we need some more great ideas, but getting these contacts to the bank and, and supporting fintechs when they want to enter and the way they want to enter the finance industry, there I think we are already great. I've also talked to European entrepreneurs who can get their friends and family in first rounds in Europe, but then they find when they want to go for the more money, they tend to end up in America, and there's an there's a, there's a opportunity drain there. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. So what the next step, what we're doing is to, to get after friends and families to provide some money. This is what we are doing here as well, and, and we, with, with some other partners like Unica, Speed Invest, are setting up a fund for that. I think what the next step is the important one. It seems that the first round with the family, the second round with small money is done here, mm -hmm. but then the great US investors came in and take the big opportunities. So we have to learn there and, and, and also be capable to take the next step. I hope so for the next two years that we come there. So Andres, you're in a uh, capital intensive uh, technology business. Uh, how do you find um, the atmosphere for innovation, risk, and growth here? For me, I'm struggling. First of all, good morning. I'm struggling in these days because I'm totally convinced that we are living in the one or two decisive decades where the whole economy is changing. The, the word of electrification was said from Markus this morning. On the other hand, I see a discussion culture, especially here in Europe, if you look to the newspaper, see what we are discussing. These are minor aspects of problems which you can say are not big if you take refugee crisis or the big Brexit stuff. That is in the middle, you can say, of our discussions. And I think we are not seeing the real, the real challenge, what we are coping in these days. What I also see that our mentality is, is not helping us, especially in the data area. We are driven from regulations from, for example, the last GDPR, the, pri the data privacy regulation, where we know that the next thing is AI. AI means data platforms, scaling of data, having data. We in Europe, we are limiting ourselves that big platforms and big data lakes cannot even be built up, while on other continents, they are going to build up. What is happening with AI? Are they going to be developed out of Europe? For sure not. And then I come back, I see, I think we lost the game in B2C. If you look to the consumer models, most of them are in the US. I think the Chinese model of protecting China as a sole big market like the US, you can say, helped a lot that you arrived. Without that, I would say there would be no Tencent. I know Alibaba and the US companies would have been there, but with the protection, you have been able to model this up. We in Europe, not. So we lost B2C. We most likely will lose AI. And now the only question is, can we safeguard the old industries like car manufacturing and these companies who are also transforming? And this will be the interesting game of the day, I think. And like the activities of BMW, Mercedes with the platforms of here, so get the maps, not from Google, but themselves. These are the interesting part. And maybe to the end, I have one customer even in Austria, and that's interesting from the mid-sized companies like Berndorf. They are producing specific stuff here. They think, look, in the past we have built machines. Now we build virtual reality algorithm and, uh, and this is the new product of the future. So there are companies transforming, but quite a few. 
I, I think it's important to keep the timetable here in mind. I, uh, a few weeks ago, I took my second pilgrimage to the Gutenberg uh, Museum and Birthplace in Mainz. And, and I like to remind people in my industry that after the invention of movable type, it, yes, it started in China and Korea, but, but uh, after, after uh, Gutenberg scaled it, as we say now, um, uh, that it took another 150 years before anyone thought to invent the newspaper. That there's a very long timetable here, and I don't, I, you know, it's interesting to hear you say that, that Europe has already lost B2C and has already lost AI. Um, is that a little fatalistic? Does anyone have any, any, any reaction to that? I think, just going back to what Marcus said earlier, I think we are still very much in the early days, and it is tempting to say that if you're a company, oh, we're already too late. I, I don't think so. I think we're just at the beginning of this digital transformation. Um, you know, you look at a service like Amazon Poly, which is text-to-speech, was developed in Poland. Um, obviously, companies have to be aware of GDPR, have to operate uh, in a compliant manner. I think it's, it's incumbent upon them to, to also choose technology partners who are GDPR compliant, who can help you navigate those regulations. But I, um, my opinion is it's, it's still very early days. And in terms of AI and machine learning, um, the, you know, the, the best innovations are yet to come. Go ahead. I, would, I would agree. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we look at things that were the dominant thing. I mean, everyone had a Nokia phone. You know, everyone used Internet Explorer. Everyone, everyone. And then uh, a few years later, they've been completely replaced. I think that is the nature of the market today, which is that even the strongest incumbent is vulnerable to the next iteration. Um, but it, uh, that also presupposes uh, a supportive regulatory environment and that, you know, the markets are relatively open. So we, we have two visions here of this world. Eric Schmidt, uh, former executive chairman of Google, said just a couple days ago that he sees a future not too far out of two internets, of a Chinese internet and an other internet. Um, and, and that, as you said, that this, this control that China has put that has enabled WeChat to grow into an all-encompassing service that can do any darn thing any customer wants mm -hmm. Uh, is, it, is a certain kind of opportunity. We'll get back to deregulation questions in a second, but so you've got two extremes here. How, um, as you look to the rest of the world, how do you look at the regulation limitations that exist elsewhere versus the fertile ground you have in China to build WeChat from wherever you want? Uh, I think WeChat is... Um in terms of a product, uh, and also the father of WeChat is Alan Zhang, and he's a product genius. So last week I was in Guangzhou hosting our annual senior management meeting, and Alan always had this very different view, but also genius view from everyone else. For example, um, some of the things he would say, if everyone agrees, it might not be right. It's probably not right. <laughs> and he has this sense of simplicity to design WeChat and into um, almost it's a perfect product. And he would think, say, if our senior management go out, we will say WeChat and the QQ are platforms, are two extremely powerful platforms as um, um, every a CEO or um, person in the audience, you would think that's a really powerful word. But Alan would say, from a user's perspective, it's not a platform, it's a tool. And as a user, I don't care about platform. I want something I can easily use, it can help me. So on a, um, um, because I'm, I'm from Great Britain, so my WeChat is not as powerful as the WeChat functions <laughs> in China. But still, I can do a lot of things. I, I can video call my colleagues from in China every day. I can use payment in China. If I don't have WeChat in China, I can't, I can't get on a DD taxi, or I can't pay for a restaurant meal. But in China, people can um, book um, ha can have health care or the even spa for the pets. The, literally, the whole life 
could be on WeChat. And then we also have this mini program, which is a bit like people can develop apps for the app store, but mini programs is an open ecosystem for everyone to build upon the, the system. So, so I don't think it's just purely from the Chinese regulation pr perspective to protect this Chinese homegrown product, but it's actually products speak for itself. And, and um, a couple of years ago in Tencent, there was a viral video from um, 20 something French, um, a Frenchman saying his favorite product is WeChat and uh, he, he hopes everywhere in Europe people could use WeChat. So I think that's um, um, just like an everyday message, but it's a quite powerful message. Yeah, I'm jealous. Uh, you know, I, I wish I could order a, a spa care for my pet and, and, and food and cars and everything else. So I think that's the, I take your point that it's not just the freedom regulation gives you its or the, or the atmosphere is it's the inventiveness of WeChat. Trevor, you're making the argument here in the administration that you're in, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but uh, one that is. Um, quite in favor of trying to eliminate regulation wherever it can. So talk about, about that notion in terms of the growth in Europe. Uh, we've already touched on it a bit, but, but what would you be recommending uh, from that perspective to Europe? What are the regulations that get most in the way in your view? Well, it's an interesting conversation and certainly in relation to China as well. Um, and I sort of chuckle because, you know, we, we talk a lot about the differences between the U.S. and Europe. Um, uh, regulatory, et cetera, um, and there are some differences, but they, they actually aren't as big as people think, you know, so I think some Europeans have this uh, concept of America as completely unregulated, sort of the wild, wild west, and everyone, you know, walks with their handguns in and puts them on the bar and then brings out their laptop or whatever, but really, I mean, if you look at California... We, we is, may be headed there, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a different story. conversation. Yes. But, um, you know, in California, which is where I'm from, the regulatory environment is actually not dissimilar to Europe. I mean, um, if rather it's environmental regulations or otherwise, they, it's, it's fairly heavily regulated. Um, and so I don't think that Europe um, uh, is sort of any sort of an extreme, but I think there's an attitude right now of skepticism around, as you mentioned, data and things like that, that... Um, it comes from different places, but it could inhibit European companies in their quest to compete globally. So let's talk about a different kind of opportunity, I think caused by America right now, uh, with Donald Trump um, talking about tariffs um, here, there, and everywhere, with uh, the um, lack of certainty about the path of America right now, uh, I think, in terms of, of, of that. I wonder whether Europeans see an opportunity now, uh, not just in technology, but also in your place in the world, in the opportunity for leadership, in the opportunity for being a more sure place to invest in. Do you see opportunity, either of my European friends here, because of what's happening in the U.S. right now? Yeah, I think... I think the, the, question, the question deserves two answers. The one is, yes, there are, this might create opportunities. On the other hand, this also creates concerns. Because what we are seeing is, and you're following this discussion, uh, you see it's, it's US and China what, what are discussing here. And, and Europe is the fragmented part. And, uh, and probably we are only sitting here because we are hosting. So it's, uh, <laughs> we also want to have us here. But, but it, it, uh, I mean, the, the risk is that, that in the, if there is not a big change on, on European level, then, then Europe w won't play any role in the next 20 years or so. This, this is the big risk, and I, I don't see the big developments there. So Europe might stay in very competitive in, in technically in some areas, but in politics and in, in those questions where the framework is built, I see quite a lot of, uh, of 
yeah, issues, problems which are not tackled. And, and this comes back to regulation or whatever. I think it's good that, that these, these convenience, these platforms are built, but then it's a question of competition. Do the others have access to this? Who decides what? And, and this has to be dealt with as well. And, uh, and of course, if, if this nice company decides uh, which payment I'm going to use, then, then it's not so, not so nice for the incumbent banks, for example. So we, we have to, to have to have it broader. So I still hear, frankly, that European attitude um, that, that you're right, just says that we're, we're, the, we're the third part of the discussion after China. I wonder whether there isn't more opportunity presented right now. I wonder if there isn't, frankly, weakness out of America, a fear of isolation out of America, which can have an impact on Europe, Lord knows, but also, I think, opens opportunities. I mean, for sure, you see a unifying element now with the pressure coming from outside, from the U.S., but also from Brexit and stuff like this, that is somehow unifying Europe on the one hand, mm -hmm. but I think we are smart enough to know that the price of what is happening there, of closing up markets, is also something which will hurt us in Europe again. And so you also see the fear of what is happening with the world and with the economy of Europe. So it's not like that we can be happy and see, look, we are unifying, we can move stuff more quickly ahead. I think it's also a big fear in Europe what is coming from the outside into mainland Europe and what does it mean for all of us. And I think, and I come back to my thesis with the two decades, in these days where it is so super important to look where our game is, where we have to set up the right ecosystems, where we should identify the candle companies in our economy to make them to electrification companies, we are getting a little bit, you can say, disorientated by the problems from the all outside which we also have to cope in this decisive decade. Yeah, I'm still hearing that European I'm, thing, right? In, in the United States, Chicago always called itself the second city, maybe <laughs> third or fourth now. Uh, but there's that, that idea of being another place in the world. I think you have a huge opportunity. I think that, there is a, that, that, that Europe could be the most stable. China is doing what China does extremely well, but it's doing it in China because the opportunity is so huge. America is refiguring its slot in the world. I think there's a, there's a big opportunity uh, here. I recognize this all has an impact on you, but this is a question of taking leadership. So let, let's talk for a minute about areas where Europe could be the leader, and I'll start the bidding here. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm critical of various European regulation of the internet because I like a free internet, uh, but I also recognize the reasons for a lot of it and, 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 the, and the impact. So you get things like GDPR, um, are also in some small ways leading to another balkanization of the web in that there are American publishers who now will not show content to Europe because they don't want to comply with the GDPR, mm -hmm. which may be stupid of us, but that's the way of the world. So it's another split of the Internet. On the other hand, no one is in a better position to figure out personal data, data, data protection, Datenschutz, than Europeans to set a a standard for how people's data are collected and shared and what control they have over it and a marketplace for it. I would argue that, that Datenschutz is a huge opportunity for the European mindset uh, uh, around. That's one opportunity I would see. What other opportunity, and argue with that one, but what other opportunities do you think are unique to Europe in its position? Anyone? I mean, yeah. there we are. I, to, make it, to make it positive, I'm totally convinced that the world leading companies in data protection will come out of Europe. Yes. I'm only not convinced <laughs> that the relevant market size is so big, like, like the big ones like Google has. So, this, uh, no, I think the opportunity, we have an opportunity. The game is not over. But I think, and this is the likeness of conferences like that, that young generation, we have to understand what's happening. We have to make a lot of pressure that the ecosystems are coming up. And I think the orientation is now, the first decade was B2C. Now it's coming up B2B. Europe was super strong in B2B. All the classical, you can say, manufacturing companies, they came out of Europe. Yes. And now we have to look how they are going to be electrified and we have to sit on this board. And I think this battle, we still can win. 
if we do the right stuff. And I think this is maybe, I sounded very negative, but we are here to warn and to set up the right things to make it happen in the end. And we are, at least in my company and for myself, we are a lot looking for the opportunities in B2B, helping mid-sized companies to go digital, to understand what's happening, because I think that's a game which we can still win. I would really agree with that. And, uh, you know, I think Europeans make great products. Uh, they manufacture things, they make great stuff. And one of the frustrations for me is the American ambassador, as you talk to uh, Austrians, you say, do you think America buys a lot of your goods? And they say, well, I don't know. And you say, after Germany, America buys more Austrian products than any country in the world. And I meet companies here, and where they compete well is around the B2B. So they make uh, electronic toll cards that are used in every toll booth in America, or they make uh, uh, computer parts for locomotive trains, or they, these are the kinds of things that Europeans have always done so well. We still buy their locomotives, we still buy these kinds of products, automotive products, etc. And so I think where Europe will do really well is building off of their core expertise, their um, specialized manufacturing and business products, and, and and taking that into the digital age. So rather than Intel inside, it's Europe inside, kind of. It's, well, I think it's, it's just, you know, big, the big media has always been primarily an America thing, and sort of pure consumer has often been American, but the manufacturing is a European um, area of great strength, I think. Jim? Yeah, I would say we've touched on a few points already. We talked about regulation. We talked about having an ecosystem that involves venture capitalism, right, where, where startups know that they can go somewhere locally in country to, to get that next level of funding. That's certainly all part of it. I think another part is cultural, and I'm not talking about Austrian culture versus French culture. I'm talking about company culture and, and a willingness to fail. Right? So if, if you lower the penalty for failure, then people will experiment more. And we are seeing that already throughout Europe. I mean, Sweden is, is a great example of, of a, a budding startup community. And, and, of course, a lot of it is built around gaming. But you look at Switzerland, which obviously you think traditional banking, you think Switzerland. But yet, in the canton of Zug, that's becoming a, a crypto valley. Right? So blockchain technology, there are tons of startups coming out of Zug, Switzerland, of all places. Right? Um, and it's because there's an environment set up to do so. Now, who knows where blockchain is going to go in the future? I think there's, there's a, a number of mm -hmm. potential applications for distributed ledgers. But I think it's, it's about creating that environment more than anything else. I can only agree, invite you to support us. Uh, that's the real case. So as an organization, we strive to build this environment. Mm -hmm. The people we have and uh, Every step we do in that direction, we see that they are more and more happy to work with us and, and that their creativity, their innovation capability is accelerating. But I agree, it takes, takes time and it's the responsibility of, of the management of these companies to make this cultural change. We are, as you said, very strictly in our processes, standards, and, uh, and the, the administration of any new thing is, is so painful that it's, it was difficult. We are now in the change. It, it was difficult to keep up with the innovation what we see in other companies. But I, I think we are improving, and let's talk in one or two years. Any particular areas that you think Europe could um, lead in? Leading in the world. You know, we're small, so we start small, but, but uh, when you talk about all these, these uh, people throughout our history, everything starts small. I think what we, what we see here is that our young people, uh, I mean, this, these are not the small Austrian people. No? They, they have all this international context. So I think the generation is already there to think global. And, and when we meet our entrepreneurs with the idea that they are thinking also global. So I think the potential is here. Any advice for the Europeans for where they could lead? Um, I can't say it's advice, but uh, this morning there is an FT article mentioning how Europe and China should strengthen the um, collaborations and partnership. And I think there are huge opportunities present for both Europe and China. And the, 
and um, both are taking steady steps and are doing lots of wonderful things together. For example, back in July, I think it was on the 9th of July, BASF from Germany, one of the largest chemical companies in the world, invested $10 billion in a Chinese factory. So the investment is actually mutual, so not ju just China investing in Europe, but um, from Europe to China as well. And for example, some of the companies we are already working with here, Lilium, the flying taxi, you will think, wow, that's like um, science fiction. But actually, when you see the prototype, you're thinking, oh, actually, it's working. When you think, mm, I can't really afford a helicopter, but actually, it's going to be cheaper than your normal Uber. And then you say, um, actually, it's, it might be really noisy because we know helicopters are noisy, but this particular jet is actually much quieter and it brings you from, say, Heathrow Airport to central London um, one hour and a half trip into 15 minutes. So it actually saves people lots of time and um, money and uh, energy. And, and that's not just a German or Central Europe business. We hope the company is going to be really successful going to China, going to US, going to the Middle East. And for example, Supercell, we invested $8.6 billion in 2016. And it's uh, probably the one games company that has the most users globally. I know all my friends in the UK, they're just hooked on it every day playing whenever they have any free time. And our own game called PUBG is a shooting game and it's uh, the most popular game worldwide as well. And also this summer I was quite fortunate um, um, as you mentioned about the Swedish startup community. So I went to visit um, quite a few like Cree which is quite similar to Babylon. It's in AI House and Klarna, one of the innovative digital banks. So it was eye-opening to see the um, startup or entrepreneurial talent in, in the Swedish and the Nordic regions. And earlier this year and last year, I went to Switzerland and visited lots of innovative biotech companies and some of the quantum security startups. So I think there are numerous opportunities for us to work together. That's inspiring, yes. Um, so let's turn the regulatory question on the other side. One thing that Europe is known for is trying to regulate the internet. Um, we have uh, Netzdege in Germany, uh, the hate, hate speech law, which uh, the, the joke is that it's killing satire in Germany. Um, little joke. Uh, and you have uh, uh, GDPR, you have the right to be forgotten, you have um, uh, lots of regulation coming out of Europe that affects American companies in the U.S. Any, any thoughts, of, you're, you're lucky to be here, not in Brussels, but any thoughts about uh, Europe's relationship to American companies uh, in regards especially to regulation? Well, I think that uh, it's a very complicated topic and for a lot of people it's an emotional topic and people think, oh my gosh, my data is being used in all these ridiculous ways um, and uh, it's an understandable fear but you know the reality based on having come from Silicon Valley and knowing companies like Amazon and Facebook and Twitter is that um, the people's data are used primarily for targeted advertising by the entity that has collected the data so uh, it, Amazon is not giving your data to anyone else not only would that be a bad business decision for them, but it doesn't, it doesn't fit their model. Um, but there is a, a fear, I think, that's going around right now. And I think my concern about regulation is that the industry is moving at such a pace that it's almost impossible to intelligently regulate. And I like to use the example, I sold my first company to Microsoft. Uh, at that time, Microsoft had gone through this bruising battle around Internet Explorer, and the government had decided that Microsoft was abusing its Windows monopoly to implement Internet Explorer, and that they were going to uh, split up Microsoft and whatever. And while the government regulators were thinking about it, uh, 
uh, Chrome and other browsers were coming around that were just naturally overtaking Internet Explorer. And the problem is, in technology, even the smartest minds, which none of them are in government, uh, and I say that as someone in government, uh, uh, the, even the smartest minds can't decide exactly where the industry is going, and regulators are usually, to put it charitably, a few years behind the rest. So it's very challenging. Any other thoughts about Europe's regulation of the net? I think sometimes the regulation is going the wrong, wrong way. For example, in the data private protection part, practical example, I even have to buy now more data from Google and from Facebook, which I have in my own company but I'm not allowed to use it because I don't have the permission, but Google makes the app release, do you accept everything, nobody reads this, yes, 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 and done. And I can go to them and buy. I think that's the nonsense. But also to make, again, optimistic flavor insight, if Europe is so good in regulation, and maybe we are, the Champions League, there are a lot of digital industries who need regulation. If you think about mobility, the autonomous driving, we cannot believe that the cars are driving unregulated. Regulation is a major part that autonomous driving is happening up. So let's come up and say mobility is a core part of Europe. Let's make the best regulation that autonomous driving is happening up. If somebody can make regulation, it's us to make the proper regulation that the car manufacturers of autonomous driving are here. And same, by the way, with flying. We have Airbus and other companies like them in Europe, strong aviation backbone in Europe. So the whole autonomous flying. Let's build this up here. Let's build up the regulation. My only fear is that in the end, this kind of regulation we are not able to make, but we should be sensible to use our competence in being the best regulators and be making the best regulation in these aspects. If it, if it yields to European companies putting out the best of breed yeah. rather than not being able to do anything because they're not regulated. Jim, were you going to say something about this? Well, I would just uh, say that you know, we're still in just the first few months of GDPR, so it'll be interesting to see how it evolves over time, but, but also just you asked, is there anything we can do? Uh, I think at, at every level, um, whenever there's a, a local referendum that involves data privacy, that people are informed. I mean, that's the, that's the key thing, that people actually understand what they're, what they're voting on or what their representatives are voting on. I mean, I, th I think that's key because th this is an issue that is not going to stay the way it is. It's going to continue to evolve. And so I think information is, is key. Go on. GDPR is, uh, for, for companies, it's a risk. Huh? You, probably you can only fail in the first couple of years when using it. On the other hand, I, I think this is, this is Europe. This is... Uh, different cultures, so people want to, to be protected in some way. It, it's always, so the, the right, the wish, I, I think I fully understand. Uh, the way it's done maybe is, uh, could be improved, so this, this is more the issue. Last question for anyone as we run out of time. Uh, let's look east for just a moment. Um, in the United States, uh, Russia's a uh, troubling world these days, um, and uh, I think we see, obviously, increased tension that way. What's the relationship uh, in Europe, speaking broadly because it includes that, but what's the relationship to where, the, the, on the business side of the world, with Russia, with a changing Russia and a ch changing Eastern Europe? Anyone? In business, we can say that, uh, and the Ambassador mentioned it, that the the trade with, with the U.S. is now bigger than, than with Russia. So we have seen exporting. We're still importing quite a lot of, of energy, oil, gas, whatever. Um, so we, we see this shift. Uh, I mean, we, we, are, we have a bank in Russia. We, we like the Russian people. So we always, I mean, we're talking politics. This is the one thing. The other thing is we, we, we talk about this, this 140 million Russian people, which are also nice people, mm -hmm. very capable, very well-trained. Um, yeah, so there is a big potential, and it's, it's uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, I hope that there is a solution which, which gives access to this, to this potential as well.
I see an interesting phenomenon in our company. Right now, we are hiring in the digital area more people from Eastern Europe than from Western Europe. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be that our best talents flew over to the US, while in Eastern Europe they've educated so much on digitalization because that was the future, but now we are coming up and picking their talents to us. And that's an interesting phenomenon right now. So there's a Western drain. Yeah, a little bit, both yes. ways. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, all right, I, we are out of time, but I want to thank our panel, and I want you to all think optimistically about flying cars over you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, panel. Thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you so much. And you can have a little break. Uh, go out and uh, grab a coffee or have a snake, a uh, snack, a snake, a snake, <laughs> have a snake. Okay. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. no. Guys, no, no, no. guys, but if there is no break. There if you no want to grab a snack, go outside, grab a snack, but there is no break. Sit back down. It's all good. It's yeah. all good. It's all good. <laughs> because they want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good.